Hey everybody, I'm Zach. And I'm Jesse. You're watching Disruptive Investing. And uh, I wanted to talk this week about the Tesla supercharger network. We heard the big headlines everywhere that it's going to be worth $100 billion. That's from Adam Jonas, Morgan Stanley's top Tesla analyst. He estimated that. That's the headline. That's the takeaway, right? That a lot of investors have made over the past couple of weeks, ever since Jim Farley, the CEO of Ford, and Mary Barra, the CEO of GM, announced with Elon on Twitter spaces that their companies will not only start implementing the NAX charging standard on their vehicles in a couple of years, but also their vehicles will be able to charge at Tesla superchargers starting as soon as next year. A lot of investors, frankly, didn't know what the Tesla supercharger network was how it worked, and why it's valuable. As we've been saying over on our Now You Know channel and Tesla Time News for the past eight years, the Tesla supercharger network is one of the biggest factors in why Teslas have become the EV standard around the world. And honestly, until you experience it for yourself, either by owning one or renting one or driving with a friend or a relative on a road trip, you just won't understand why. The Tesla supercharger network is disruptive. It's a disruptive technology. Now, I hear what you might be saying, Zach and Jesse, come on. There are other charging networks like Electrify America and EVgo that have high speed chargers. Yes. But number one, Tesla was the first. They disrupted the industry by coming out with 150 kilowatt and now 250 kilowatt charging speeds. This made it possible for Zach and I in 2016 to drive from Boston to San Francisco, up to Seattle and back 25 states two provinces of Canada, and 75 superchargers in our Model X back in 2016 with zero problems. Yeah, it's honestly what launched our work on YouTube. So number two, Tesla has stayed the leader with over 5,100 supercharger locations in all 50 states of the US, every province of Canada, 48 countries around the world. I'm probably wrong, there's probably more now. Over 47,000 stalls. Tesla far outnumbers all the other charging networks combined. Okay. So we've established that the supercharger network is disrupted. It allows Teslas to travel effortlessly, quickly, cheaply between cities, between states, between countries. And it's been happening for over a decade. It's a proven technology. But will it really be worth $100 billion by 2030? Let's take a look at Jonas's assumptions. Jonas's team started off by asking, what if Tesla made its own electricity? So essentially put up solar and stored it on site using its power packs and its mega packs. So essentially energy for Tesla at near zero marginal cost, free energy. It's not a bad question. Tesla could do it if they wanted to. And it's something that Elon says he plans to do. And seven years is a long time, especially with Tesla time. Jonas also estimated 8% of all US miles driven being from electric vehicles in 2030. And I wanna stop there for a second because I'm going to be addressing this later in this episode. He's saying that by 2030, seven years from now, his he had to make some kind of estimate here. He thinks that 8% of all the cars driving will be electric and that's what he's using. I think he's wrong. We'll talk about that more in a second. His next assumption was a 20% supercharging market share, four miles per kilowatt hour efficiency. So he's taking the, all the average of the cars, like our Ford Lightning gets 1.8 miles. Your Model 3 gets more like five. So he's averaging it out. I think that's pretty good. And the revenue charged at superchargers, he said, would be 32 cents a kilowatt hour. He then assumed 20x, so 20 times the fiscal year 30 net operating profit after tax discounted. You don't have to be an expert here. That's pretty standard uh, fare for when you're trying to estimate what something will be worth in the future. I think 20X is a little bit too much. I think he might have maybe used 10X instead, but whatever. And he assumed a 9% weighted average cost of capital to determine a value of the charging business. If you're not into these numbers, you can just suffice it to say he used pretty standard numbers. So I'm going to come back to some of these numbers, but for now, let's get into their different cases of reasonable, plausible, dominant, and monopoly. Okay, so we'll start with their most bearish case, the reasonable, which assumes 10% EV mile penetration, 50% Tesla share of supercharging, and 30% net operating profit after tax or no pat margin. That would equal... $3 per share for the supercharger network. As of today, there are 3.1 billion shares of Tesla outstanding. So that would value the supercharger network at $9.5 billion in 2030. And I hear what you're saying, but you said it was going to be 100 billion. Right, because this was his uh, reasonable case. Next up is the plausible case. So this assumes 20% EV miles penetration, 70% share of supercharging, and 50% no-pat margin. 
this would give you $14 a share or $44.3 billion value in 2030. Uh, so I just want to talk for a, set, for a second about the 20% EV miles penetration because yeah. I think a lot of people watching right now are like, what the heck is that? That, we're pretty sure, means how much of the miles driven, the EV miles- Of, of your car. Of your car, right. you are going to accumulate the energy from through supercharging. So basically, um, how much of your driving are you going to be driving on supercharged miles? Now, a lot of comments said that he got this wrong, that um, most people, as we kind of know in the EV world, charge at home or maybe at work. And so that's usually, the figure that gets thrown around the most is like 90%, right? That 90% of the time you're gonna charge at home. So they're going like, why would you assume 20% would be done at a supercharger? So I just wanna point out, I checked my Tesla app, which has charging data for me, and I was at 19% supercharging. Interesting. And so, you are a pretty average person. I'm a pretty average person. I didn't think it would be that high um, because I was just thinking like I'm driving back and forth to work every day. However, when I do drive back and forth to work every day, I'm not using that many miles. Right. When right? you go on a trip, you're using more. I'm using a lot more miles. So it really changes the effect. I mean, to me, 99% of the time I'm charging at home, but the mileage completely changes. And so that's, you know, EV miles penetration. And this number goes up as he goes along, but I don't think that it's too unreasonable. Right. Because I think that in 2030, there's going to be so many superchargers around, we might start using them like gas stations today. Exactly. I think that when there's a supercharger 50 miles from you, you're just not going to happen to go there very often. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's two miles from you, you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I'll just pop in there on my way home. And that's, I think, the really good point here is that up until now, I agree. It's probably been a low percentage because, like you said, they're just not that convenient. As they get more and more, you know, dense, we are going to use them more. So I think for now, twenty percent is a good number to be using. And but I do agree with you. I think as he ups this number, as we'll see, it's not a bad idea. Next up is the dominant case. It assumes thirty percent EV mile penetration, which again I think is fairly reasonable. Eighty percent Tesla share of supercharging, and what that means is there's going to be EVgo, maybe Electrify America. What percentage of the market will be Tesla? I think. They're going to put the others out of business. So I, I think it's not even unreasonable to think 100%. And then 70% no pat margin. That leads to a value of $33 per share or $104.5 billion in 2030. And this is what most news outlets used in their headlines. But there's still a very bullish case left, the monopoly case. Yeah, this assumes a 50% of EV miles penetration probably a little high, 100% Tesla share of supercharging, that's if they become a monopoly, and 80% no pat margin, which would lead to $78 a share of value, which would be 247 billion in 2030. So going back to Jonas's overall assumptions, what we talked about in the very beginning, I think he made a big mistake. He estimated 8% of all US miles driven from electric vehicles in 2030. First of all, number one, why did he just use U.S. numbers if this is going to be a global charging network? It already is a global charging network. Right. I mean, there are a thousand chargers in China. Oh, 1,700. 1,700 chargers in China. Yeah, I mean, it's the biggest in almost every country it goes into. It's the biggest. Right. So, I mean, look at Norway, for instance. I mean, they already blow that number away. And by 2030, new ICE cars will be illegal in some countries. Number two, 8% by 2030 is just way too low. It's linear thinking. If you, he basically, I think, took like, okay, well, this is what it is. And he just went, boop. It's too conservative and it throws off all the other calculations. In my opinion, he should have incorporated this percentage into his different cases or made a chart like I did. Oh, nice chart. Yeah. So I added one variable to his thing. So I know it's complicated. So let's just relax here. Just take the top line. That's his numbers as is. I didn't touch them. He assumes 8% of EV miles driven. Okay. And those are his reasonable, plausible, dominant, and monopoly cases. Okay. Because I think by 2030, it's going to be more than 8%. Well, let's play it out here. Then. Okay. That's why I made the chart. So you pick what you think, right? So what if he's wrong about the number? It has a huge impact on all of his downstream numbers. So what if it's 10%? Look at the second line Choose and choose your case, his dominant case. Let's say, let's say you choose that that one that goes up in value by 25 billion what if it's 15 percent tesla supercharging is now worth 245 billion what if it's 20 percent that's 612 billion what if it's 25 percent that's 1.9 trillion what if it's 30 percent that's 7.1 trillion and what if it's 35 percent that's 31 trillion dollars of value by 2030 now 
That's under the dominant case. That's we under could, the dominant case. You could change it. Drop down to the plausible case, which would still be 193 billion. Now you might say, okay, Zach, how did you get? Like, why'd you stop at 35 percent? Even I'm not going to say that it's going to be 100 percent miles driven in seven years. There's just too many ice cars on the road. Even if we stop selling them today, they do last. I do think it's going to be somewhere in the 30 percent range. And I know you're saying you're crazy, Zach. I look at the street now. I hardly see any EVs. Yeah. Think back seven years ago. Seven years ago is when Jesse and I started this whole thing, right? We were like lone morons on the road. Like no one knew what we, were t- we even were driving, right? Model X, we pulled up and people were like, are you from another planet? Now, no one bats an eye. In seven years, that's a long time in Tesla time. They are going to, the, the cars are getting cheaper. There's probably going to be autonomy. I know you think I'm wrong. There's probably going to be the Model 2, which is going to be cheaper. Tesla's going to be making 20 million cars a year. So I do think that it's not unreasonable to assume 30% of EV miles driven, which means, again, depends on which case you pick, but the numbers are going to be insanely <laughs> just for, big. Just for a second. Just for a second. Let's 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 go with the 35%. Let's, let's assume the most bullish case. Is it stupid? Maybe. Maybe it's really stupid, but let's look at your chart under Monopoly. <laughs> $74 trillion. $74, $74 trillion? But, uh, here's, but here's my case, okay? I know none of us were probably alive back when the automobile became a thing and horses died. Mm. Well, they didn't die. Uh, but, I mean, horses they, didn't they, die. <laughs> horses stopped being a thing, um, except on farms and, you know. Yeah. But they stopped being the major form of transportation. But when that happened, it wasn't like it took 100 years, right? It didn't go 1909 to 2009. Mm-hmm. It went 1909 to like... 1914. It happened like that. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of work to do, right? We had to build roads. We had to um, come up with all sorts of laws Mm -hmm. and traffic signals, and we had to come up with headlights and safety things. And then we also had to come up with uh, roads and uh, gas stations and all sorts of things. Seems like it seems like if that if that happened, you know, if, if we went from horses to say gas powered cars, that like the industry that that powered this would be like one of the most wealthy <laughs> industries in the world. It just seems like that would be the case. And it so, so it sort of seems like if we jump ahead to the future, whoever can deliver the power there you go. to the next thing, the next cars, the EVs, would be like the taking, most wealthy <laughs> so, industry like, in so the wait, world. Are you saying like taking Mobile, Shell, you know, Irving, all the big uh, oil companies and combining them? Yeah. yeah. It, especially if you could generate. Oh, oh, and there's, yeah, there's one little point there that he, that Adam made at the beginning of his, his supposition yeah. here, which was that Tesla would make their power themselves. And I know you're saying right now, I go to most superchargers, I don't see any solar panels, so mm-hmm. they're not doing that. Yeah. But in seven years, they could be doing that. And maybe it'll take them a little longer to cover all of them, but it's not hard. They know how to do it. They actually own a solar company. So even vertically integrated, they could put the solar and the batteries at every supercharger, which would mean they would power their own network from the sun. They wouldn't have to pay the Saudis. They wouldn't have to build pipelines. They would have the power right there. I don't think that's too hard to believe. Now you might be saying, well, then why aren't they doing it? Well, because they've been focusing on getting the cars out. That's important. If they took their money and they didn't do that, they wouldn't have this $19 billion in the bank that they could have. They would have already been spending it. I think since Elon has said this early on that he wants to do this, he's going to do this. He's a long-term thinker. So think about this. How much money would Mobile and Shell and all these companies be worth if they just got their oil delivered to them by aliens every day for free? They have to go pump it out of the ground and put it in ships and they have to put it in pipelines. It costs them a lot of money. Then they have to process it. But Elon won't have to do any of that. Tesla will just take... Oh, solar thank you boom here free it'll be almost free for him so that's what we're not getting here and that's why i think it's not crazy to think that my chart along with adam's work here it's probably on the right hand bottom corner value it's i don't know exactly but it's probably worth trillions of dollars and that's why we've seen a slight bump in tesla stock this week as people have been going like like, oh "Hmm, oh, i didn't know anything about but you know ford thinks it's pretty cool that's pretty neato ford doesn't even (laughs) understand it all they understand is that they (laughs) need they need it i i really think you know there's these big stories right there's this stuff where it's like this this huge company and then it all comes down to this small story how important was it that jim farley's kids were like why aren't we charging at the cooler looking supercharger stations yep that's that's it this is all because of jim farley's kids I, it really is I'm not they moved the stock i think <laughs> that's why it happened and we've heard this before we've heard this before 
when other people in people's lives have the Teslas yep. and either sit down and explain it to them mm -hmm. or drive them around in it. It's one of Tesla's biggest assets yep. that no analyst is ever going to tell you about, no. which is that, I mean, do you remember when Jim Cramer got to go for a ride in his friend's Tesla and his and, kids oh, and his it was kids. His, it was his daughter that got him to do that. Who was like, you're being an idiot, yes. dad. And he listened to her. And he listened to her because she's in his life. Yes. That's an ha important thing. Have you ever been the first mover of something? As you're watching this, think about some technology which you just happen to be so into that you did it first. Maybe it was um, high def TVs. Or email. Or email. Or cell phones. Exactly. You, you were the first. And everyone around you was like, like what? I, don't, well, I don't need a That's cell so phone. That's so expensive. <laughs> There's pay phones everywhere right. and there's always going to be pay no phones. one's going to spend that much money on a tv and you're like it won't stay this expensive and you were right now they're super cheap that's what we're talking about here if you are watching this now and you get this then as an investor you are ahead of the crowd disclaimer here of course we are big tesla investors we are long we are not financial advisors do your own research mm -hmm. figure it out for yourself but what we're saying is we've been right for the past eight years about <laughs> tesla and we're going to continue to be right and we wouldn't be doing so many different YouTube channels that mainly focus around Tesla if we weren't extremely bullish because this is the supercharger network. This is something that's been around for a while. Right. And we're looking at that bottom number there and we're going, hmm, add add some autonomy to that. Add some robots to that. Yep. Add some uh, add some VPP to that. Yeah, and this isn't just one country. This isn't just like, well, Tesla will dominate in the US. They're building out their network as we speak. On Tesla's Time News, every week at the end of the show, we tell you about all the new superchargers. And people have asked us over the years, like, why do you list them all? Because it's one of their biggest moats. It's one of their biggest assets. And every single one adds to their value. So. I hope you got a lot out of this. I hope that you can see that this formula that Adam J Jonas came up with is good, but it had to be tweaked. And I would love to know what your thoughts are in the comments below. Let us know what we got wrong. Maybe there's something we're missing. Because maybe $74 trillion is too much. Maybe we are going to start to hit some upper limits there. I'd love for you to fill us in on what you think. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time on Disruptive Investing.